Hey, this is your favorite German composer, Sebastian Schurt. Welcome back to Split the Diff with a very special episode today. Not only do we have Maro the Cat with us today, but also exactly one year ago I published my first video of this channel. Back then it was an episode of... Since then I added another show format called... So for this anniversary episode, I thought I will just merge those two show formats together. We will focus on one note, but we keep it short and simple, espresso style. And today it's all about the U correct note. I always found all the different operations available within the note a little bit overwhelming and sometimes it's a little hard to tell what the real difference is between them. Let's say we want to get rid of some green in our footage. Do I use the saturation, green or green suppress operation? We will also learn in which order all these different operations will be applied within the note. After watching this video, you will definitely have a good understanding of what's going on under the hood and it will help you to make the right choice. You can also find it in a kind of like a blog post style on my website, splitthediff.com. You can also find the script that I'm using in this video. And please don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter to stay up to date and don't miss out on future exclusive content. I would like to thank the Foundry, especially Jen and Ian. All my supporters, followers and newsletter subscribers and everyone who reached out with feedback, good and bad. You really made the past year an exciting and fruitful one. Thank you very much, Alicia, for always pushing me when I lost sight of the bigger picture, even if it meant less time for the two of us. And now put your seatbelt on. Are you ready? Let's go! The first thing we have to talk about is what all the available options have in common. And it's this graph. We know it from another note in Uke, the Ukea. We also know the concept of a color wheel. It's an abstract circular arrangement of colors organized by the chromatic relationship to another. And in math classes, we learned that a circle has 360 degrees. So we can describe or find a specific color or U by its degree coordinate, if you will. But how do we get the U value of specific areas or pixels of our image? After all, we usually deal with our three channels, red, green and blue. Each of them are combinations of U, saturation and luminance. So let's have a look at the mathematical formula for the conversion from color channels to U. First of all, we need two important components, the darkest and the brightest value of every pixel. Then we have to compare the different channels with each other. If the red value of a pixel is brighter than its green and blue components, the formula is the following. If the green value is the brightest, it slightly changed to this formula. And at last, this is what we need in case the blue channel contributes the brightest value. You can see that every formula is offset by two from the others. That way we are able to fit in all of our U values between the range of zero and six. We use all this in an expression node by using the TCL syntax. We might end up with some NaN values, which we will simply set to zero. We have to multiply the resulting values by 60 in order to convert it to degrees on a color circle. If we now have negative values, we need to offset them by 360. Now every value sits right at its correct position in the color circle. Instead of sampling our red, green and blue pixel values, we are now able to see the actual degree of our pixels on the U-wheel. We can simplify this by using only one expression node, obviously, but I just wanted to show you how this conversion works. Also, there's an easier way in Nuke to extract or isolate U values by using the color space node. We can either set the output to HSL or HSV. Interesting for us today is only the first channel and it's the same for both options. Looking at the values though, we seem to only find values between 0 and 1. Where did our 360 degrees go? The RGB to U conversion that happens in the color space node outputs normalized values, so everything sits between 0 and 1. In order to get to that result, we simply divide our values from before by the maximum amount of degrees we have, which is 360. That will keep a value of 0 at 0 and will set a value of 360 right to 1. So nothing gets higher than that. 
Alternatively, we can skip the step of converting it from the 0 to 6 range up to 360 and instead we divide it by 6 to normalize it. Instead of offsetting negative values by 360, we now only need to offset them by 1, since our 360 degree range is compressed into a range of 0 and 1. I also have to add that I had to convert the input to sRGB before going through our formula in order to match the output of the color space node. Now it gets a tiny bit more confusing. In Nukes Yukia, we get a linear mapping of hues from left to right, ranging from 0 to 6. So there is no need to multiply our formula values by 60, as seen earlier. Every unit stands for 60 degrees. 6 times 60 is 360. We have to make a different adjustment though. For some reason, the U ramp in the Yukia node is offset by 60 degrees from the color wheel. Since every unit represents 60 degrees, we have to add 1 to our values. But we leave 0 untouched. Now everything sits in the right space. To sum it up, the base of it all is the conversion formula. In all cases, we want to get rid of none values. Since the conversion will squeeze our U values into 6 units, we can then decide if we want to stay in that range to match what the U key is using. We only need to offset all the values, except 0, by 1. This is what we can see on the right side of this graphic. On the left we can see what we have to do in order to stretch all the values to 360 degrees. We simply multiply the 6 units that the conversion formula outputs by 60. 6 times 60 equals 360. The example in the middle shows us how to normalize the 6 units into a range of 0 and 1 by simply dividing by 6. For all the three options we then have to take care that negative values will be offset into positive space while maintaining the respective range. Now that we clarified what a U is and how to get to it, let's talk about the U-Kia node. It enables you to pick specific U values, or actually ranges, and create an alpha for them. That way you can use it as a mask for other operations, for example if we want to desaturate this range of U values. The saturation threshold value takes a look at the saturation of our image and helps you to isolate areas even more. We can see that not only the jacket but also the face got affected quite a bit. Luckily it's less saturated than the jacket. If we increase the saturation threshold above the saturation value of this area, it will drop out of our selection. That way we can preserve more of the original saturation. Ok, we got all the background knowledge out of the way. If you're wondering why I talked about all this, when deconstructing the U-correct node, we will notice that all the different operations available can be broken down as number one, applying a mathematical formula, and number two, applying it through an alpha created by the U-ranges we define with our curves. You'll see in a minute what I mean. Let's go over all the different treatment options from top to bottom. We start with saturation. Under the hood, increasing or reducing saturation can be done in multiple ways with different formulas. One of the most common approaches is to use the REC709 luminance math. Since our eyes perceive certain wavelengths or colors brighter than others, although they might have the same contribution to an image, this formula helps us to simulate that. If we look at this image for example, green clearly pops out brightness-wise, although we have a very strong blue presence too. If we convert an image to its grayscale representation, we want to make sure that this still looks the brightest. In the red and blue channels, this area is rather dark, so we should not simply create an average of all three channels, we need to prioritize green. Out of our three channels, our eyes are the least sensitive to blue. That's why the International Telecommunication Union came up with the following formula. The U-correct saturation operation uses a variation of this called BT709-1. To increase or decrease saturation, you use a function called linear interpolation or LERP. Color 1 in this case is the normal color of our image, while color 2 is the fully desaturated version of it. I will use a merge expression node in order to use this calculation for every one of our three channels. 
We already talked about how to desaturate an image, so I store this in a variable called deset. So we don't have to type it out for every channel. And now I use our lerp function. Upper scale A, lower scale A means I'm using the alpha channel of input A. Color 1 in this case is our respective color channel. If I would use a fully white alpha now as input A, our image would end up fully desaturated. Instead, I will use a U key and use the same values on our curve that I used for the actual U correct. Let's randomly adjust the curve and see what happens. Certain U areas experience a decrease in saturation, others stay the same. Let's use the same values for the U key and see what happens. It matches. I hope that setup helps a little bit to understand what happens under the hood. Let us go over the next operations and you will see and understand the pattern here. Next up is luminance. I choose some random values again, which leads to areas becoming brighter and other areas becoming darker. This is a simple multiplication. All three channels get multiplied with the same value, the incoming alpha channel, from input A in this case. The U key uses the same values as our U correct again, and you see that it matches. The RG and B operations basically do the same thing, but for one channel at a time only. The three individual operations match their respective deconstructed setups, and of course you could use them in a stack, or the channels can be shuffled together in order to match the U-correct node that has all three operations combined in one node. I hope you can understand the pattern now. Under the hood, every operation triggers a mathematical formula and then uses our U-curve to generate values to multiply with. To put it simple, the U-curve adjustments create our alpha. R-sub, G-sub and B-sub use a concept called color suppression. A common field of usage for it is keying. The green or blue screen might be visible through semi-transparent areas like motion blur or the color is just so strong that it bounces around the set and it gets reflected a lot. The color spills over. We then use the so-called spill suppression, which is basically the same. What it usually does is compare our three color channels and based on the algorithm we use, it removes or suppresses the chosen color and replaces it with one of the other channels or combinations of it. There are a few common algorithms out there. Let's say we want to suppress our green channel. We have an algorithm called blue limit. It determines where the values in the green channel are higher than the blue channel, and if that is the case, the green channel adapts or will be replaced by the value of the blue channel. There's an algorithm called red limit. Some formulas get a bit more complex, like average, which outputs a mix of the red and blue channels. And we have something called a double blue average or double red average. I was playing around with a lot of different algorithms in order to match the one that the U-correct node is using, and it seems to be a slightly different version, a combination of formulas. We also have to use our lerp or linear interpolation function again in order to blend the values based on the incoming alpha channel. If I compare the outputs between the individual u-corrects and our under the hood setups, it seems to do the job. Here's the adjusted formula for the blue channel. And here for the red channel. Alright, one last thing. I played around with the order of operations to see how the U-correct node gets processed internally. It seems like it starts with color suppression operations, followed by the saturation and it ends with the individual color channel multiplications. I was able to place the luminance operation before the saturation operation, but it's also possible to use it at the end instead, since it's just a simple multiplication. I added up all of our individual operations into that single U correct and it matches that specific order. To sum it up, we should look at some real footage. Let's say we are working on the sky. As we've seen, the saturation operation will give us a nice weighted solution to decrease the chroma by balancing all three channels. 
This gives us a nice natural response. If we isolate the blue channel on the other hand, we will not accomplish a reduction in saturation but rather a shift in colors. We've learned that this is a simple multiplication of the blue channel. So as if you're using a multiply or gain of the grade node. That means decreasing blue leads to introducing more yellow and orange. Since we are not involving the other channels, it can make our image look less believable quite quickly if we dial it in too harshly. If you look at it this way, by tweaking R, G and B separately on a grade node, we are already splitting up the image into three components. With the U correct node, you could now go in and for one single channel only, tweak one specific U. So that's cutting your margin down even further. Now you can imagine why it can look quite graphic real quick. But it's definitely great for very specific or subtle treatments. And of course you can always smoothen out your curve in order to avoid harsh transitions. Blue suppression on the other hand takes the other channels into account so the result is less extreme. It only includes the other channels to produce new values for the channel we are tweaking it for though. In this case blue, but it doesn't affect the other channels itself. This way you can focus on a very dominant U as we would find in blue and green screens and counteract with a color shift without being too aggressive on other channels. This is another good example. If we want to reduce the warm orange yellow tones in those trees, we could use a multiplication on the R channel, but it will also adjust these areas. The Dispel algorithm preserves this area since it's checking if red contributes the brightest pixel values here, which is not the case, so it stays untouched. But keep in mind that you will be bound to the specific Dispel algorithm. If you want to be more flexible, you definitely need to use some dedicated Dispel setups or gizmos. Luminance uses a multiplication for all three channels. But it can also break real quick since U values sometimes change a lot from pixel to pixel or are not that obvious in very bright areas for example. And you can end up with some pretty nasty edges if you push it too much. So always make sure to stop for a second, be aware of what you want or need to do and what the underlying operation does mathematically and then you will know what it can do for you. I hope this little deconstruction helped a bit to understand and distinguish between the different operations available. Hopefully you will be more confident choosing which operation to use for your specific situation. If something is not quite clear or you have further questions, feel free to leave a comment or contact me via the website. Otherwise, cheers to the second year of Split the Diff. My name is Sebastian Schütt and I'll see you soon. Music